Matthew chapter 5 is where we're going to be, but let me give you a quick summary. Matthew chapter 1, we saw that Jesus is the son of Abraham, the son of David, and the son of God. He is the deliverer of his people. Chapter 2, we saw some people loved his coming and worshipped him. Those were the wise men. Uh, Some people were scared and tried to kill him. Others were willing to trade their birthright for the proverbial bowl of pottage and did not care to seek him. Chapter 3, as the lonely, rugged voice in the wilderness, John the Baptist preached repentance and faith in the coming king. Many turned from their sin and identified themselves through baptism with the coming Messiah. Jesus subjected himself to that baptism, identifying himself with the kingdom. Then a voice from heaven and the Holy Spirit identified Jesus Christ as the Son of God, the chosen King of Israel. So John had been preaching the uh, kingdom of heaven's at hand. Jesus shows up. The, uh, John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God. And, uh, uh, the Holy Spirit descends upon him like a dove. And, uh, and there's a voice that comes out of heaven that says, This is the King. He's been preaching the kingdom is coming. Here's the King. So then in chapter 4, we see Jesus was led by the Spirit of God into the wilderness, battled Satan's temptation, and Jesus, the true Son of God, succeeded where Adam had failed back in Genesis chapter 3. Oh, we also saw in uh, chapter 4 that Jesus began preaching the same message that John the Baptist preached. John had been announcing the coming kingdom, and then it's like he handed over the microphone to the king. He said, he's coming, he's coming, and then he handed him the microphone. Here you go. And Jesus uh, uh, took over and started preaching the exact same message that John was preaching. Jesus is the great light that sprung up in the darkness, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and disease among the people. In the next few chapters, we'll actually be looking at what's known as the Sermon on the Mount. Today, we're going to try to look at uh, this passage. Uh, We're going to be looking at uh, verses 1 through 16 of Matthew 5. Under these headings, the uh, sermon as a whole, like taking a big picture of it, and then we'll look at the Beatitudes and the state of being. So with that, uh, let's stand, and we'll read our first portion of this. We're going to start in Matthew chapter 4, beginning in verse number 23. Matthew chapter 4, verse 23. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. And his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought unto him all sick sick people uh, that were taken with divers diseases and torments, and those which were possessed with uh, devils, and those which were lunatic, and those that had the palsy, and he healed them. And there followed him great multitudes of people from Galilee, and from Decapolis, and from Jerusalem, and from Judea, and from beyond Jordan. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them. And we'll stop there for a moment, and let's pray. Father, we thank you so much that we have the opportunity to read your word and to study it. We do ask that you'd help us to see what you want us to see. Help us to hear what you'd have us to hear. Dear God, I pray that you would be glorified and exalted in all of this. I pray that you give each one of us a greater love for your word and a greater devotion to thee. And Lord, if there's anyone here that's not saved, we pray that you'd work in their hearts and save them. And Lord, pray that once again, in all things, that you would be exalted. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. While it's possible that the Sermon on the Mount took place in one particular setting at a particular time, it's not completely evident that that is the point that Matthew is specifically trying to make. It's very possible, just as Matthew chapter 4, beginning in verse number 23 through 25, just as it gave a summary of the Lord's ministry, uh, where it says that he taught in the synagogues, preached the gospel to the kingdom, healed the sick, Matthew gives us several examples or specimens in chapters 5 through 9 of Christ's teachings and the miracles that he performed. So chapters 5, 6, and 7, we see what's uh, known as the Sermon on the Mount. And that could be that he, uh, that he preached a sermon on a particular mountain at one particular time, and all the multitude was there. Or it could very easily be as well 
that Matthew is uh, giving us a uh, collection, saying here's the various different things that he taught, just like he just told us in chapter 4, saying, hey, he did all these things, he did all these things, and did all these things. He may very well be continuing that same, because he's not trying to specifically make the point on this particular day, at this particular location, he preached this particular sermon. Instead, this is, the, uh, this is a, a big picture of the message that Jesus was constantly preaching. Throughout the three and a half years of his ministry, he was preaching these things. First comes the sermon, as we just mentioned, and then comes the miracles, because in chapters 8 and 9, you see a whole list of miracles. Now, that, that sort of gives me the idea that maybe that's what he's doing. He's just giving us a summary of, you know, uh, his gospel ministry. Uh, he's giving us a collection of, uh, of the sermons that, uh, that he preaches. And then he gives us all back to back, boom, 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 right, right after each other. He gives us all of these different uh, uh, miracles that he performed. And then you get to chapter 13 and you see back to back, a whole bunch of parables uh, back to back. So it's very possible that that's what he's doing. However... If you believe that the Sermon on the Mount is one complete sermon, I completely understand. I just hope that you don't hold it against me that I suggested a possibility of another option, okay? I don't believe that it actually changes anything about the message that he was saying. I think that it just, I just found it interesting. Um, so I wanted to present that. The main theme, though, of the Sermon on the Mount is the law of the kingdom. Jesus is the king of that was prophesied to come. Uh, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And Jesus is the king of this kingdom. And where the king is, there's his kingdom. And here he's giving his, uh, uh, he is giving the law of his kingdom. He's give, going to give us uh, various different things. He's going to tell us uh, these are the identifying marks of his citizens. And then he says, here's what, uh, uh, here's what my citizens look like. And then he's going to tell us that you've heard it said in the Old Testament, you've heard the law said this, but I say unto you this. And he goes beyond and deeper and so forth. And we're going to see this as we look through this. But the main theme is the law of the kingdom. In contrast to other kings, when they issue their decrees, I mean, I can, I'm just sort of thinking about if you see a king, Probably the king's not going to do the talking himself. He's going to have somebody else uh, to do all the talking for him. But let's pretend you have a king that's going to make an announcement, and, and he gets up and he says, you, 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 and do this, and do this, and do this. But this is not the way that Jesus did this. Instead, Jesus sat down and he taught his followers. He, his whole mannerism is different. He's not the kind of king that a lot of people were looking for at that time. They were looking for a great military leader. But this isn't the, what they were expecting. But yet these people are following him because never did anybody speak the way he speaks. And here they're following him. And when Jesus came to a point, he sat down and he taught his followers, taught his disciples. He describes the identifying marks of his citizens. That would be known as the Beatitudes. And he emphasizes the mission of the kingdom. And that is to glorify our Father which is in heaven. In chapter 5, uh, it, it's very possible that uh, a lot of things seem to overlap as we're looking through the, uh, uh, through the Sermon on the Mount, but it seems like there's a pre uh, uh, prominent, predominant uh, theme in chapter 5 and another in 6 and, verse, and chapter 7. In chapter 5 is our relationship to the law. In chapter 6 is our relationship to our Heavenly Father. And then in chapter 7 is our relationship to others. Now, like I said, we're going to see an overlap of a lot of these things as we go through each one of these chapters, but it just seems very interesting. Now, just thinking about our relationship to the law and thinking about this is the law of the kingdom. If you recall, if you go back in your memories to, uh, to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 18, the Lord promised that he would send a prophet like Moses who is going to speak face to face with God, who intercedes on behalf of the people, and who speaks to the people the very words of God. And at that time, it was Moses. Moses was the one who went up onto Mount Sinai, spoke with God, received the Ten Commandments, and came back and declared to the people what they said. 
And it says in Exodus chapter 20, And all the people saw the thunderings, and the lightnings, and the noise of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they removed and stood afar off. And they said unto Moses, Speak thou with us, and we will hear. But let not God speak with us, lest we die. They said, don't let God talk directly to us because we're going to die if we are that close. In that encounter, God came down in majesty and the cloud hid him from the people's gaze. But here, here on this mountain, Jesus sits in, uh, uh, in the middle of his followers. He was called Emmanuel, God with us. However, Jesus is not just a prophet that speaks to us the words of God, but he is God come in the flesh. The only way we know the Father is through Jesus. Jesus said in John 14, 7, If ye had known me, ye would have known my Father also, and, hit, and from henceforth ye know him and have seen him. If you recall, Salvation Station, uh, uh, John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. And then they said, we don't know uh, where you're going. We don't know how to get there and so forth. Um, but Jesus said, you do know the word. Uh, you do know the way and you know where I'm going. And then uh, I think it was Philip that said, show us the Father and it sufficeth us. And Jesus said, if you've known me, you've known the Father. Jesus is not just a prophet, but he is God come in the flesh. And in, anything you want to know about the Heavenly Father, if you study Jesus, you'll know the Father. In the Sermon of the Mount, we have both the law and the lawgiver. We have both the words and the author who wrote those words. I mean, imagine if you was able to have a conversation with the author of a book. Let's say poetry. You, you find a good poem and you're reading it. And sometimes it's like, man, that really, uh, that really sounds nice. Sure wish I knew what it meant. But you know, if you could talk to the author and let them describe and explain all about it, why did he write what he wrote and what did he mean and everything else? Here in the Sermon on the Mount, we have both the law and the lawgiver. One of the key verses in our passage, uh, uh, verse number 17, Matthew chapter 5, Jesus said, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. So here's a question. How many commandments are there? Well, you, we know that there's the uh, Ten Commandments that Moses received up on the mountain. And, uh, but actually, if I haven't counted these, somebody else counted them. And uh, a lot of people have repeated this number. So I just believe that, they're, uh, that it's true. 613 commandments. And I, I would have to say that I don't think that's all of them. I really think that the 613 is more like a, uh, um, it, it's a collection of the uh, of all of the commandments. Because ultimately, uh, let's first of all say this, that the 613 commandments, not all of them apply to all people. Some apply specifically to women. Some of them sp uh, apply specifically to men. Some apply specifically to the priest. Some apply to only certain uh, situations and certain times of the year. So there, there's different ones at different times, but there's 613 there. But they're only a selection or example of God's commands given to us on purpose throughout the narrative of the Old Testament. These 613, it's been said, is more like a, uh, uh, an exposition of the Ten Commandments. They describe the Ten Commandments in more clarity. If you recall, the first half of the uh, Ten Commandments is talking about our relationship to God. And the uh, second half is talking about our relationship with man. And so when you look at through these 613 other commandments, uh, I'm sorry, 603 others in addition to the first ten. So when you look through those, you see a lot of them that deal with our relationship to God. And others that deal with our relationship to one another. So they are uh, building on that. But yet Jesus goes on and tells us that the Ten Commandments are actually summarized in the first and great commandment and the second commandment. To love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and with all thy strength, and to love thy neighbor as thyself. 
And on these two hang all the law and the prophets. Everything hinges upon that. And so all those others, 613 commandments, there would probably be millions of commandments. Because how deep, how wide, how, uh, how far can you go within those two commandments? Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, with all thy might, and love thy neighbor as thyself. Is there a commandment in the Bible that says, thou shalt not love Kentucky basketball? Well, no, not specifically. But it does say, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, thy soul, thy strength, and thy body, and, and so forth, right? And so if anything stands between us and God, then therefore there's a commandment against that, Right? And the same thing with pizza, the same thing with, uh, with riding a bicycle too fast down the hill, whatever. I mean, all of these things, uh, everything hinges upon those two commandments. And here Jesus is going to go more in depth, and he's going to teach us that the commandments of God are not just what we see on the surface. What we see on the surface is uh, if we're looking out over, uh, uh, over, a, uh, over a lake and the wind's blowing or the ocean and you see the, uh, the tips of the, uh, of the waves, you see those, but there's a whole deep ocean or a whole deep uh, uh, lake full of water there that you may not see. So with that, let's think about this. Uh, chapter 5, 1 through 16 we see the Beatitudes, and these Beatitudes are not a contradiction, nor do they oppose the Ten Commandments. Instead, these Beatitudes are examples of the fulfillment of those commandments. And we'll get to, get to them here in a moment. And now, so how are the Beatitudes a fulfillment of the law? Well, it expresses the very spirit of the law. It's deeper than the surface. It's impossible for us to keep the law. That's, a, uh, that's as simple as that part is. It's impossible for us to keep it. Because even Adam, when he was perfect, and he was given one law whatsoever. I mean, there's only one commandment. That one commandment is, don't eat the fruit. And he didn't have a sinful nature. Uh, there wasn't any, you know, uh, he was completely perfect. And even he couldn't keep it. Nor can we fulfill the law. Christ fulfills the requirements of the law on our behalf and then gives us a new heart to love what we once hated and hate what we once loved. But the Bible tells us that in the new covenant that God is going to give us a new heart and by writing his law in our hearts, we fulfill the spirit of the law. We see uh, uh, Paul talks about it in Galatians chapter 5 when he says the fruit of the spirit is love. Joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Also in Matthew chapter 5, uh, 19 through 28, Jesus talks about the commandments of God are not simply the 613, but, but your righteousness will need to exceed those. The commandments go deeper than the surface. They go all the way to the heart. Matthew chapter 5, 29 through 30 talks about the seriousness of God's commands and once again emphasizing the heart of the problem. Because if you recall, I know we haven't read this, but he said, if your hand offends you, cut it off. If your right eye offends you, cut it off. So forth. The problem is not your hand. The problem is not your eye. The problem is not your foot. The problem is your heart. And it's the seriousness of the matter. Jesus is saying, your righteousness needs to exceed the words written on a piece of paper. Your righteousness needs to exceed what your hands or your foot or your eye does. Your righteousness needs to go all the way to the heart. And it only comes from Jesus Christ. Amen. Now let's look at the Beatitudes which we've been talking about. It says, and uh, let me just start again in verse number one. Seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the pure in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. 
Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. This word blessed means to be supremely blessed or fortunate, well off or happy. It's not just simply a uh, uh, happiness like um, winning the lottery or having your ultimate dream come true. It's not that much of a uh, supreme blessing. Wow, I'm a millionaire. It's not like that. This is talking about an actual state of being. This blessing is something that comes from God. Imagine this. Psalm 32 tells us that the man or woman whose sin is atoned for, who God will not account, uh, hold accountable for their iniquity, that person is supremely blessed. Yeah. Psalm 32, blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto, unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. You want to talk about an extreme blessing from God, a state of being blessed, a supremely blessed, being, uh, uh, being happy, something that uh, you are well off, something that uh, you have, uh, have uh, you are in a state of well-being. Imagine your sins being forgiven. God himself will not hold you accountable for your transgressions. You, God says, the, uh, the psalmist said there, that blessed, how blessed, how happy is the man whom the Lord will not impute iniquity. Psalm 1 tells us that the person who delights in the word of God is supremely blessed by God and is likened to a tree by the river of water bearing much fruit. Notice also that these uh, blessings that we just said, blessed are the pure in spirit, blessed are they that mourn. This is present tense. It doesn't say that the poor in spirit will be blessed when they receive the kingdom of heaven. It says that blessed are. They are blessed right now in this very condition. Wait a second. Why would anybody think that you'd be blessed if you're poor in spirit? Or how can you be blessed while you're in a state of mourning? But yet the Bible says blessed are they that mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are you when you are persecuted for righteousness sake. It's not a blessing that waits for some other time. You're blessed in this very moment. God's grace is sufficient and available right now while we are poor, while we are mourning. The state of being supremely blessed by God is not simply a feeling of euphoria. It is reality, regardless of the feeling, a state of divinely bestowed well-being. The Beatitudes demonstrate that the way to heavenly blessedness is opposite the worldly path people normally follow to find happiness. The worldly idea is that happiness is found in riches and merriment and abundance and leisure and such things. The real truth is the very opposite. There's also a paradox here. Christ's kingdom is a heavenly kingdom, not a kingdom of this world. As he would say later in John 18, Jesus said, If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight. But instead, Jesus teaches his disciples these beatitudes. Blessed are they that are poor in spirit. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the, uh, they that mourn the meek, those which hunger and thirst after righteousness, the merciful, and so forth. Something else that, uh, that caught my attention with this. John the Baptist was preaching, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And people under the preaching of John the Baptist, they felt the conviction of God that they have, uh, that they have been neglecting the promises of God and they've been living their life just like anybody else. I mean, it's been 400 years since we've heard any of the prophets and even the religious leaders... Uh, don't really pay much attention to it anymore. And they're just going through the rituals of sacrifices and so forth. We're doing all these things. And in the meanwhile, we might as well just, hey, live life. Just enjoy life and just do the best we can. And John the Baptist comes on the scene and he's preaching, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And under the conviction of God, these people realize that they have not been right with God. And so they repent of their sin and to show that they want to be identified with the coming kingdom of God, come, uh, the coming Messiah, they are baptized and here they have identified themselves with the preaching of John. They've identified themselves as repentant sinners and they've identified themselves with each other. Okay? But then here uh, the Pharisees came. The Pharisees came and said, 
Well, baptize us too. And John said, what are you doing here? You bring forth fruit, meet for repentance, and then I'll baptize you. It's like, I mean, can you imagine the audacity? John the Baptist told them that they had to provide proof that they've been saved. Proof that they uh, are repentant. Well, Jesus then uh, is preaching the exact same message. Jesus went about preaching, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But the interesting thing here is, Jesus is actually telling us exactly what the fruit of repentance is. He's showing us the identification marks of, of a person who has been redeemed by the grace of God is found right here in these Beatitudes. True kingdom citizens have these characteristics. This is the proof that someone has surrendered to the king and is in a right fellowship with his kingdom. When I was thinking about that, I was reminded that even Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, he gave a list of people who shall not inherit the kingdom of heaven. He said, know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners. None of those shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you've been washed, but you've been sanctified, but you've been justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. He said, such were some of you. You used to, but as fruits of repentance, your life has been completely changed. Your sins have been forgiven, blessed by God. And being blessed by God, you've received a new heart that expresses new love. And being blessed by God, you've been washed and sanctified and justified. And Revelation 22 says, Blessed are they that do His commandments, and they that, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter into the uh, may enter in through the gates into the city for without meaning without the kingdom are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie outside the kingdom are those who do not submit to the king we could also read if we if we had the time we would read through uh, Galatians chapter 5 19. Uh, through 21 talks about the works of the flesh. The works of the flesh are manifest. It's this, 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 this. All these are the works of the flesh. But the fruit of the Spirit that we already read. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Jesus goes on here and he tells us, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This is not just simply referring uh, or referencing poor people. Uh, the book of Luke says, blessed are ye poor, but the context tells us that he's not just talking about just poor people. There's no blessedness in being impoverished or being a pauper. There's no promise from God of special blessing simply because you're poor, so therefore God has a special blessing for you. There's no a promise of that in the Bible. Instead, it tells us, and I was thought about this, Abraham Lincoln once said that uh, God sure loves uh, poor people. We know that because he made a lot of them. But you know what? Yes, we know that God loves poor people, but he tells us here that, we, uh, that uh, blessed are the poor in spirit. The word poor does not always signify a uh, condition of want, but rather one who is aware of their condition and seeks relief. Poverty has various different degrees. And by the way, if you ever think that you're poor, just look around and you'll find somebody else in a worse situation than you are. But poor in spirit speaks of humility where one realizes that they are poor and wretched and blind. They are humble and lowly in their own eyes. They see their want and they bewail their guilt and they thirst after their Redeemer. The poor in spirit are those who feel that deep sense of uh, spiritual destitution and bankruptcy. And they, comp uh, and they comprehend that they are nothing before God. Let me give you three examples. The publican who's smiting his breast uh, uh, at the temple and he says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. He realizes that he is poor and destitute and has no right to look to God. But yet he, say, he cries out to God and says, be merciful to me, a sinner. What about the disease-weakened, hunger-tortured prodigal? 
who left his father and he spent all that he had in riotous living and there he is in the hog pen and when he comes to himself and he realizes that I have wasted everything, my life is ruined and he goes back to his father and he says, I am not worthy to be called thy son. He realizes his Poverty. He realizes his destitution. He realizes that he is completely impoverished. He is poor in spirit. Think about Paul, the once self-righteous Paul, who now says, oh, wretched man that I am. So why does the kingdom of heaven belong to these people? It doesn't mean that they're going to rule, but that they are subjects or citizens of it. The kingdom of heaven is theirs because they seek it. And therefore find and abide in it. They that are rich in spirit, the rich in spirit, they don't need God. They don't feel that they need his word, nor his righteousness. They'll never bow to his kingdom. Why? Because they're looking to advance their own kingdom here upon this earth. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. There are many things that cause us to mourn. That word mourn means to grieve. And just thinking about how would Jesus comfort those who are mourning? There is both a spiritual as well as a physical and, and emotional and social aspect of this. There are people who are mourning and grieving. How would Jesus treat somebody who is grieving? Somebody who is weeping bitterly? We too are to weep with those who weep and attempt to comfort and bear the burdens of those who mourn. Often we are faced with mourning and grief so that we, uh, for the, a lot of times in the moment, we do not understand. We may never understand why am I going through this particular situation? Why am I mourning? Why did I have to suffer this thing? But the Bible says, blessed be God, 2 Corinthians 1, 3. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble, by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. Sometimes we go through the various different uh, mourning stages in our own life, so then we can receive comfort from God, so then we can be a blessing and a comfort to others. Isaiah 61 yeah. Isaiah 61 tells us, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has, uh, hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn. Preaching good tidings unto the meek, and bind up the brokenhearted, to comfort all that mourn. The mourning that is spoken of here in in Matthew chapter 5, is, is a broken heart for sin and its consequences. And I know, there, like I said, there's other aspects of it as well, but I believe that each one of these beatitudes, sort of like a, uh, uh, like a, uh, like a necklace, where each link uh, is connected to another, and it, it just forms a uh, beautiful necklace. So, I don't know, I'm not very good with, you know, necklaces. Maybe I need to go buy one for Mandy or something, learn something. Anyway, but each beatitude springs from the preceding and are, links, uh, are like links of an ornament of grace upon the neck, a chain of jewels. The grim reality, though, of sin, the grim reality is that sin has to be reckoned with. Personal responsibility and guilt are facts. We want comfort, but we don't necessarily want sorrow. Not all sorrow and mourning is blessed. I mean, just because somebody is mourning, just because somebody is grieving, that in itself is not blessed. The type of mourning, such as the mourning over sin, this is blessed. Mourning over sin means having godly sorrow that produces repentance leading to salvation. He who takes the true measure of himself cannot but sorrow over the frightful gulf between what he should be and what he is. And if he knows that there is more than misfortune or unavoidable weakness at work. The comfort though, blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. 
This comfort is forgiveness and salvation. And we ought to receive the comfort that Christ gives. We shouldn't be like Jacob who refused to be comforted after the death of his son Joseph. We should trust Christ. He comforts those that mourn. Let me uh, speed ahead here. Uh, we don't have time to look at each and every one of these, but let's just look through some of them uh, briefly, though. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. The meek are those who quietly submit to God. They bear insult and are silent. Uh, they return a soft answer, who in their patience keep possession of their own souls when they can scarcely keep possession of anything else. These are people who, even though they feel that they have the right to seek vengeance, they submit that vengeance. They submit to Christ and let him have it. Jesus referencing Psalm 37, 11, But the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. They shall inherit the earth. One of the things that's uh, interesting is that uh, uh, people who are meek uh, are also, uh, they also tend to be happy in this world because meekness promotes uh, wealth, comfort, and safety even in this world. Uh, Proverbs 16, 7, when a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. It says, blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be, for they shall be filled. This is not seeking their own righteousness, but they're hungry and thirsty for Christ. Uh, this looks back at Isaiah 55, where it says, Ho, everyone that thirst, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, come ye, buy and eat. Yea, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which satisfieth not? Hearken diligently unto me, and eat that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. Incline your ear and come unto me. Here and your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. This is not talking just about salvation, but it's talking about finding our chief joy in Christ. We hunger and thirst after so many things in life. We're seeking for something that's satisfied, but only Jesus Christ can satisfy. Psalm 107, verse 9, For he satisfies the longing soul and filleth the hungry soul with goodness. One of the songs that we sometimes sing, More, more about Jesus, or All that thrills my soul is Jesus. It's a uh, very interesting but uh, very true statement. Uh, it's a popular statement by uh, uh, a preacher that uh, most of you know, but very true statement that it says, God is most glorified in us. When we are most satisfied in him. Paul himself in Philippians chapter 3 tells us that what things that were gained he counts for loss for Christ. He doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. For, uh, and he counts them but dung that I may win Christ and be found in him. Not having mine own righteousness which is the law. But he goes on and he says I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. He is hungry and thirsty for Christ. I just want more of Jesus. I just want more time with him. I want to be more like him. I want to uh, think like him. I want to act like him. I want to love like him. I want to be merciful and compassionate just like him. Anything that you can find about Jesus, strive to be like that. And that's what this means, to hunger and thirst after righteousness. Just want to be like Jesus. The next one, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. God himself is merciful, and Christ's followers are merciful. Mercy is shown. It's not just a feeling of empathy. We must not only bear our own afflictions patiently, but we must do all we can to help those who are in misery. We must have compassion on the souls of others and help them. If those, are, uh, uh, those that are in sin, and we seek to snatch them as brands out of the burning. Mercy is not just toward those who need it, by the way. It's also toward those who don't deserve it. Many times we say, you know what, I'll be merciful to those who need it. But that person over there, they definitely don't deserve it. I mean, that person did me wrong. But if we're going to be merciful like Jesus Christ is merciful, Christ taught us to love our enemies as well. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Pure in heart. These are uh, Psalm 24 3 through 5 says, Who shall ascend into the hill of God, or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. But guess what? No one of us has a pure heart. Our purity only comes from Christ. 
So what is it talking about here if we're talking about blessed or the pure in heart? For they shall see God when not a single one of us is pure in ourselves. Obviously, number one, the foundation, our purity must come from Christ because if you're trying to work your own purity, if you're trying to just keep the commandments or whatever, just trying to be a good person, you will never see God. The only way you can see God is if you have the purity of Christ uh, uh, counted unto you because he is the only one who is pure. But here we can also see that this pure in heart is having a heart that is right with God. David said in Psalm 51 verse 7, he said, Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. David, already saved by the grace of God, realizes that he is in sin, and he realizes that his fellowship with God had been broken, and here he's crying out in repentance, in bitter tears, and he's praying, and he says, purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. He said, also blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Christ's followers are peaceful, and peacemakers. A peacemaker is a man who labors for the public good, feels his own interest promoted in promoting that of others. Instead of fanning the fire of strife, he uses his influence and wisdom to reconcile other people, to adjust their differences and restore them to a state of unity. Many times we see, I mean, we see it in, uh, in the uh, qualifications for a pastor and deacon and so forth. It says, not a brawler. Nobody who's uh, going to be uh, quick to pick a fight or anything like that. But that's the same thing for each and every one of us. None of us should have the attitude and the, uh, and the atmosphere around our life of somebody who's always going around with a chip on their shoulder, somebody who's trying to pick a fight, and I just got, some, I just got a bone to pick with you. No, the people who follow Christ are peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. The gospel is called the gospel of peace because it reconciles to men. Jesus says that peacemakers are the children of God because as he is the father of peace, those who promote it are his children. It also said, blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you, persecute you, say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted the, the prophets which were before you. It's strange to say, uh, to say, happy are they who suffer. And that the righteous should suffer simply because they are righteous. Also seems strange. But the hatred of, of the human heart to everything of God and goodness that of all those who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution in one form or another. As a religion of Christ gives no quarter to vice, so the vicious will give no quarter to this religion or its professors. 1 Peter chapter 3 says, But, and if ye suffer for righteousness sake, happy are ye. And be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that's within you with meekness and fear having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. For it is better if the will of God be so that you suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. For Christ also hath suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. The last point, though, that I wanted to mention here um, uh, just briefly, reading verse number 13 in our text. Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is henceforth good for nothing, but to be cast down and be trodden under the foot of men. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And he giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. It says that ye are the salt of the earth, and ye are the light of the world. He's talking to his followers. They've, uh, he was preaching, repent for the kingdom of heaven's at hand. He shows them these, uh, these are the characteristics of those who are followers of Christ. And then he says to these people, 
these characteristics, people who make up these characteristics, those people are the salt of the earth. Those people are the light of the world. It doesn't say that people have to find a light, find or try to become salt or try to become light. They are the salt of the earth. They are the light of the world. And all they have to do is shine. All they have to do is be who they are. Be. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are they the mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the... Uh, so forth, the whole list there, right? Hunger and thirst after righteousness. You do those things and you will already be a light in this crooked and perverse nation. Among whom ye shine as lights in the world. And we'll close with that. Uh, Philippians chapter 2 uh, is a summary that Paul gives us a summary of Matthew chapter 5. He says, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. This is God working in us. Actually, I'm sorry, that's what it says next. For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Remember we mentioned Psalm 32. Blessed is the man whom the Lord imputes, uh, does not impute iniquity. And then we talked about the fruit of the Spirit is what actually produces the work in our lives. He says, do all things without murmurings and disputings. Hmm, that sort of sounds like what we just read in these Beatitudes. That you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. All we've got to do is just submit to Jesus Christ. And he will do these things in our life and through us. And none of this is to bring glory unto ourselves. We let the light so shine before men that they may see our good works and do what? Glorify our Father which is in heaven. All of this is to bring glory unto him as we submit to our King, King Jesus. With that, let's pray. Father, we thank you so much that we have the opportunity to read your word and to study it. We do ask that you'd help us. Lord, we are so weak and so sinful, and we so easily go astray, following after our own ideas and passions and, and desires and, and our own uh, goals. Dear God, help us to surrender everything unto you and just serve you. And Lord, we pray and we trust that you would do a great work of grace in our lives, making us more like you every single day. Help us to hunger and thirst to be more like you. And Lord, in that, that we can be a light in this crooked and perverse nation. Thank you for your mercy and grace. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor.